The significance of tourism industry to the Maldives development and economy has been on the increase since its inception in 1972. By the year 2020, tourism industry has become the main industry contributing over 47% to the GDP directly. By the end of 2019, tourism industry has expanded to all corners of the country with over 53,000 beds. Maldives welcomed over 1.7 million tourists in 2019 and had very high hopes for 2020. However, the COVID-19 pandemic meant that 2020 was to be a stressful tough year. Based on the little knowledge the government had at the time on COVID-19 and the readiness level to deal with the pandemic, just like many other countries, Maldives also decided to close the travel borders as a safety first matter and did so on 27th March 2020. The impact of the closure was felt across the country within weeks. With the economy and the nation at the verge of a major economic and social crisis, President Ibrahim Mohamed Saleh made the brave decision to reopen the Maldives for international tourists with reasonable safety measures. President He himself was at the helm of both COVID and tourism management. Hence, in consultation with all stakeholders, Maldives borders reopened on 15 July 2020. The focus was on a practical model that would give reasonable safety to public staff and tourists. The small secluded islands created a natural bubble which made the management of COVID rather simple, except in the densely populated capital Male. To enter the Maldives, tourists only need a negative PCR test and a hotel booking. A situation monitoring unit was established at the ministry to coordinate with health authorities, tourists, property management and line agencies. Ministry also established a special help desk at Velana International Airport. The guidelines provided by Maldives Health Protection Agency in line with World Health Organization was helpful in establishing widely accepted protocols. Ministry also started weekly meetings with industry stakeholders to review and adjust the protocols for effectiveness and practicality. During the first week of border reopening, the tourist arrivals were a trickle. Yet with relentless push from both government and private sector, Maldives soon started establishing it as a rather safe destination. Ministry worked with WTTC and acquired its safety stamp and joined hands with UNWTO and PATA in disseminating destination information to other agencies and tourists. Maldives established special travel links with number of countries, especially an air bubble with the neighboring country India. As soon as the vaccines are rolled out, tourism sector employees were given priority. Maldives also introduced inbound cashless travel insurance package. Tourist properties were allowed to isolate COVID-positive tourists as well as direct contacts in-house according to set protocols. In addition, government also managed tourist facilities for isolation and quarantine. Tourists started posting massless imagery on social media. Maldives started sending a strong message that the country is ready to receive travelers and provide a reasonably safe, enjoyable holiday experience. To support the industry pulled through the very difficult situation, government deferred land rent on resorts for two quarters and also helped restructure their loans and also provided income to support tourism sector employees who were affected. Ministry of Tourism, MMPRC, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other stakeholders worked together and reached source markets in person. Global mainstream media started running stories on Maldives' innovative initiatives and its growing popularity. By December 2020, Maldives moved towards a full recovery. Maldives welcomed 2021 with one year countdown to its tourism's golden year 2022. Irrespective of uncertainty of COVID-19's new variants and unpredictable border restrictions in source markets, Maldives never looked back. Some of the resorts in Maldives registered their best ever financial months in 2021. The most strong contributor to the recovery is the dedication and the hard work of Maldivian employees. Maldives is the proud title holder of the world's leading destination twice in a row. CNN labeled Maldives as an international tourism success story of 2021. Maldives' tourism product is now much stronger and out of 59,500 registered beds in industry, 58,400 are in operation. Arrival so far this year is just 4.8% below 2019 levels. Considering that over 25% of Maldives' traditional markets has not yet started traveling, the last quarter of the year looks rather promising. We look forward to commence in 2023 with fifth tourism master plan of Maldives that is being completed with ADB funding.
Maldives appreciates the engagement and support of ADB and other international agencies and organizations and the hard work of thousands of volunteers in our recovery. With diverse product portfolio of Maldives with incomparable warm hospitality of Maldivians, Maldives is set to make even greater strides in the future. Thank you. Excellent. I think this is really fascinating. So ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the seminar on reimagining tourism coming back from the brink. I am Manmohan Prakash and it is my pleasure to be moderating today's seminar. Today is indeed a historic day. 27 September is being celebrated as the World Tourism Day with the theme of rethinking tourism in Bali, Indonesia. And our seminar's theme of reimagining tourism is very apt and relevant. Both events recognize and highlight tourism as a crucial pillar of development. We all have been tourists many times and agree that tourism has enormous potential to drive growth, create jobs, and promote mutual understanding through human-to-human -human interactions. Tourism has played a key role in the Asia and Pacific's development, and were it not for COVID-19, tourism would remain one of the most dynamic sectors of the region. Prior to the pandemic, the travel and tourism sector supported more than 185 million jobs and contributed more than $3 trillion to the regional GDP, close to the 10% of the region's economy. However, COVID-19 dealt a huge blow to tourism and Asia and the Pacific was the worst affected region in the world. Tourism arrivals in Asia and the Pacific fell by 84% in 2020, while the contribution of the travel and tourism sector to the region's economy fell by 50%. The pandemic is estimated to have led to a loss of over 34 million jobs in the travel and tourism sector in the region. It is good to note that more recent numbers reveal signs of recovery with tourism arrivals between January to May 2022, almost doubling comparing to the same period in 2021. However, the recovery remains weak and uneven, while some destinations bouncing back faster and stronger than others. The Maldives, as we saw today from the video shown earlier, is one destination where the rebound has really been quite inspiring. In many countries, though, reviving tourism remains a huge challenge, particularly in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and also economic crisis in some countries. In addition to reviving tourism, and addressing these immediate challenges, we also need to start tackling long-term issues that have been plaguing the sector even prior to the pandemic. Issues related to the tourism's impact on the environment and local communities and issues related to tourism's ability to create direct livelihoods are some of them. ADB on its part has been trying to do its part by strengthening the support to the tourism sector through an appropriate mix of lending, non-lending and technical assistance support. Let me share a few examples. ADB has been helping countries safely reopen their borders and restore travel confidence. This support has been particularly crucial for the small island developing states in the Pacific, which are heavily reliant on tourism, but have limited capacity to cope with the pandemic's impact. ADB is also helping address longer term issues related to resilience, sustainability and inclusion. Inclusion. Examples are community-based tourism COVID-19 recovery project in Cambodia that seeks to promote and preserve cultural resources and the Mongolia Sustainable Tourism Development Project, which promotes inclusive benefits for communities and nature-based solutions to protect wilderness and heritage values. ADB is supporting strategic tourism policy and planning to build longer-term resilience through country-level initiatives in Fiji, Kiribati, Marshall Islands, New, Donga, PNG, Vanuatu, and regionally through the Pacific Tourism Organizations. Friends, ADB is also continuing to leverage its sub-regional programs and initiatives to encourage a collaborative approach for tourism development. Under the GMS or the Greater Mekong Sub-Region Program, the GMS Tourism Infrastructure for Inclusive Growth in Cambodia, Lao PDR in Vietnam, and the second GMS Tourism Infrastructure Project for Inclusive Growth are helping accelerate inclusive economic growth along the GMS economic 
corridor by improving the tourism related access infrastructure and the environmental conditions at the cross border tourism centers under the carec program or central asia economic regional program adb has helped formulate the carec tourism strategy 2030 which sets out the long term vision guiding principles strategic pillars and targets to promote sustainable safe and inclusive tourism development in carec countries in south asia the sasec or the south asia sub regional economic cooperation program is working on a regional tourism program as a new initiative this will include promoting the sub region as a single tourism destination through the development of a buddhist tourist circuit a medical tourism circuit and a sea cruise tourism circuit more recently as part of reinvigorating sasec a new subgroup for tourism has been set up to promote tourism among the sasec member countries and as we just saw also in the video adb is also helping develop the fifth master tourism plan for maldives finally in the pacific a suite of regional studies are being undertaken to support the res resumption of sustainable tourism these studies cover tourism taxation tourism finance businesses enabling environment for tourism and opportunities to guide longer stay visitors or digital nomads in the pacific so friends as we can say a lot is happening and the relevant tourism post covid 19 pandemic is becoming more and more clear the time is now to seize the opportunity to reimagine tourism to benefit the visitors the hosts and the natural world as we all try to do our part to restore tourism to its full potential we need to create opportunities for us to share our knowledge best practices and vision for tourism's future this is precisely the objective of today's webinar so friends thank you for joining us today and i hope we will have rich discussions and interactions during this session so let me now before i start introduce the panelists for today so we are honored to have with us four distinguished guests who will be sharing their views on how we can ensure that the tourism comes back in a manner that is more resilient sustainable and inclusive our panelists offer a diversity of experiences and views from the government and the private sectors they come from the from across the asia pacific represent developing member countries at different levels of tourism development from mature as well as nascent tourism markets so first we are privileged to have dr abdullah masoom welcome dr masoom dr masoom is the minister of tourism republic of maldives he is currently a member of the Pacific Asia Travel Association Executive Board. In 2008, he held the government's cabinet portfolios as Minister of Tourism and Civil Aviation and Minister of Environment, Energy and Water. He headed the Maldives Tourism Promotion Board to, from 2004 to 2008. Welcome, Dr. Masoom. From the Republic of Armenia, we have Ms. Susanna Hakobayan, welcome, Ms. Uh, Susanna, Deputy Head of Tourism Committee, Ministry of Economy, Republic of Armenia. Ms. Hakobayan has extensive work experience in the sphere of tourism in Armenia and abroad. In the past 10 years, as a tourism, tourism consultant ex and expert, she has been involved in various tourism development projects financed by different international organizations and being implemented by local consulting companies. Thank you for joining us, uh, Ms. Susanna. Next, we also have two representatives from the private sector. From Sri Lanka, we have Mr. Hiran Kore, chairman of the Jetwing Symphony PLC. Mr. Kore is the first Sri Lankan to be appointed chairman of the Pacific Asia Travel Association. He served on the board of small luxury hotels of the world from 2007 to 2014, and the UNWTO Tourism Ethics Committee as an alternate member from the year 2013 to 2021. Welcome, Mr. Kiran Gorey. Next, we have from Fiji, Ms. Pantasha Lockington, the CEO of the Fiji Hotel and Tourism Association. Ms. Lockington has 30 years of experience in the tourism sector and six years in the public sector. As the CEO of the Fiji Hotel and Tourism Association, she is the industry's proponent in government engagement for tourism businesses with strong advocacy for growth opportunities, productivity, and equitable reforms. Welcome, Ms. Lockington. Bula vinaka. 
Thank you. Finally, from ADB, we have Ms. Jia Hyong Hong, Principal Urban Development Specialist and current, concurrently the officer in charge of the Urban Development and Water Division of the Central and West Asia Department of ADB. She has worked in ADB for the, over 20 years and in 25 ADB member countries. Prior to joining ADB in the investment banking, and she holds a master's degree in international affairs and business administration from the George Washington University, USA. So friends, as you can see, we have a very diverse set of panelists for today's seminar. So let me, before we start the seminar, share a few things on the logistics of this today's meeting. So if you, apart from hearing from our panel, we will also very much like to hear from you, our audience. So please make full use of the pigeonhole live to pose your questions to our experts. If you're watching us live, all you need to do is to click the Q&A icon on the right side of the page, Q&A icon on the right side of the page, and it will direct you to the session's Q&A. You can also vote on any questions that interest you. So I hope th this is something that is useful and we would like to have interactive seminar today. So let me now set the tone for today's discussion and invite Dr. Masoom to tell us about how Maldives has managed the spectacular recovery of getting the tourism back. So Dr. Masoom, I would now like to invite you to deliver the keynote address. Dr. Masoom, over to you, please. All right, okay. There you go. Uh, first of all, um, warm greetings of uh, World uh, Tourism Day. Uh, it's time to rethink tourism. Um, I wish to on kick off. Uh, thank uh, Eddie President, His Excellency Mas Masat Masatsugu Asukawa, Eddie's Board of Governors, um, other excellencies present here. Uh, delegates, of course, the other speakers and panelists. Uh, very warm welcome and very warm greetings from the Maldives. Yeah, tourism is a major industry to many small island states. Ups and downs of the variables related to global tourism industry are impactful to countries that depend on tourism. Just bear with me for a while. <clears throat> for any country that is dependent on tourism, any adverse effect on the industry will have very strong implications. The COVID-19 pandemic, regional and global geopolitical instability, and their subsequent impacts on economic variables has significant impacts on tourism-dependent countries, as our moderator uh, just mentioned uh, in his opening uh, about the small Asia-Pacific uh, countries. Maldives' economy, development, and people's livelihood are very much dependent on tourism. Our tourism industry contributes over 47% to the GDP directly and uh, over 46% of the government revenue. In addition, it is the primary source of foreign currency earnings to the highly important dependent Maldives. We have to virtually, uh, we have to import everything. This meant any impact, no matter how small, has its implications to the Maldives. Hence, Maldives was amongst the economies that, have, that suffered most due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Maldives closed its uh, borders on 27th, and um, uh, we just wait for uh, 15 weeks before we open the borders again. Maldives President, His Excellency Ibrahim Mohamed Soli made the brave decision to reopen the borders on 15th July, 2020. That decision, based on the feedback from the consultants, consultations with uh, stakeholders, 
was uh, very much anchored on restarting the economy with reasonable safety to the public, tourists, and the tourism sector employees. We believed that the show must go on, tourism industry must go on. Even though the Maldives borders were open, due to the global travel restrictions, the tourism pickup in the first two months was rather slow. Yet the government were committed to work on a model to move with tourism with the prevailing circumstances. This entailed a holistic approach with engagement and contribution from everyone, uh, from the government-related authorities and agencies, state-owned enterprises, private sector, um, uh, health sector, local councils, um, uniformed services, NGOs, volunteers, and the general public. So it's the whole of Maldives approach. The COVID management and tourism recovery drive with His Excellency President Soli at the helm gave clear messages to the world. Maldives open for tourists and ready to welcome them. Travel to and within Maldives is not complicated and Maldives is one of the safest destinations. Maldives had simple practical protocols to ensure reasonably reasonable safety and had a very transparent policy on COVID-related information dissemination. I think Maldives is one country that communicated so frequently that uh, uh, the situation, everything in Maldives was very clear to everybody. Of course, our geography with many secluded islands and the one island, one resort concept of tourism greatly assisted in managing the crisis. As there were no universally practiced protocols, Maldives utilized the World Health Organization, World Tourism Organization's guidelines to tailor the protocols that would work for the Maldives best. Irrespective of varied restrictions globally, Maldives only required a negative PCR test result and a hotel booking. That was it. So tourist facilities, however, were required to follow the usual COVID management protocols, which they really did. It's important to keep reminding potential markets of the safety levels and the readiness of the destination with assurance. For the Maldives, this was done best by the tourists themselves. In addition to the communications through international and local media by us, the tourism ministry, Visit Maldives, MMPRC, and the private sector, the tourists' messages on social media played a very important role in building tourist confidence to travel to the Maldives. The Bollywood stars who came to the Maldives and who posted on Instagrams, they had so many, so much coverage. By end of 2021, Maldives tourism was well on its way towards recovery. One of the main factors for the quick recovery was the loyalty of tourists. Maldives is very popular for repeat visits, uh, thanks to the outstanding hospitality and personal touch of the dedicated industry team, uh, employees, to capitalize on this, Maldives also introduced Maldives Border Miles, first of its kind in the world, initiated by the Maldives Immigration in association with the Ministry of Tourism, Maldives Market and Public Relations Corporations, and Maldives Airports Company Limited. Government had facilities and means to address and attend to medical attention needed for various levels of COVID patients and direct contacts. Tourists had the choice to get quarantined or isolated in resorts or at government-managed COVID facilities located across the Maldives. Prevention is better than cure is a tried and tested approach to health and other aspects. The most significant game changer undoubtedly was the early COVID vaccine rollout. The government placed the travel and tourism industry workers, especially the economic frontline team at the forefront of the vaccine queue, just after the health workers and those with comorbidities. comorbidities. Um, so I, thus the vaccine rollout was very swift with uh, which really helped to further enhance Maldives safe destination image. Irrespective of such assurance, tourists still need to budget their holiday with possible 
expenses for an eventuality of COVID exposure. In this regard, in, uh, as, in association with Allied Insurance of Maldives, uh, we uh, introduced Maldives inbound uh, COVID insurance package, which gave great comfort to those price sensitive tourists. The strong relationship between the government and tourism industry, private sector and related authorities and line agencies were a crucial factor in tourism recovery. Ministry's establishment of a situation monitoring unit for coordination and timely support for those in need proved to be very, a very effective step. Further to this, uh, branches of tourism industry had their focused associations and we had regular stakeholder meetings with them to review and fine tune our approaches and guidelines. Their engagement and contributions were invaluable in getting to where we are today. COVID-19 crisis gave many countries the opportunity to rethink and reimagine tourism. Are very appropriate for uh, this year's uh, tourism theme. It gave an opportunity to revisit the strategies for resilience. Tourism is a fragile and highly sensitive industry. Hence, to minimize the impact of shocks at source markets, it's critical that each destination have multi-source markets. As you have seen from the our video, 25% uh, of source markets are still not here, but we are rather doing good because of the diversity of markets we have. Even with the smoothest of travel arrangements, travel to long haul destinations are tiresome. During the COVID pandemic, travel and border crossings were rather stressful for many. Hence, many opted for a longer holidays, thus significantly increasing the duration of stay. We also learned that the travel and tourism business, including airlines that were flexible in showing changes to travel itinerary and packages without a cost burden were highly valued by tourists and those businesses managed to secure a loyalty customer base because many tourists really they when they book a holiday they were not sure what is going to happen in the next week and those who said okay you can change your holiday at any time and uh, we will adjust it so that those type of businesses were really successful Tourism is glo global, hence diplomacy and strong relations with other countries and international organizations are crucial to tourism success. The close relationship we had with countries and international organizations enable us to manage COVID better and speed up tourism recovery. Particularly noteworthy are the role in making COVID vaccines readily available, enabling to establish special travel corridors. The most important lesson of all is that together we are better. Hence, in the Maldives, our campaigns, we often use the tagline, together we can. In relation to the wealth of, wealth of the nation, Maldives government was very generous in supporting the industry and its employees. The government gave income support to tourism sector employees and helped the industry with financial restructuring and adjustments of dues to government and bank loans. This helped the industry to keep uh, its head above water during the tough, tougher months of 2020. By December 2020, Maldives had a very promising outlook for 2021. In fact, December 2020 uh, and uh, January, February, March of 2021 were registered as the best performing months uh, ever for many uh, upmarket properties. And the 2021 tourist arrival surpassed the year's forecast of 1 million by 30%. Tourism growth was um, stalled during 2020, uh, mainly because of the logistical uh, uh, hiccups in the global uh, arena. But now it's gaining momentum. And this year, 10 new resorts will come into operation, out of which already three are open. In the, in the coming years, we expect 8,000 new beds to be introduced to the Maldives annually. This growth will be expedited as the strain on global logistics is, and so that people will be able to get uh, their material from uh, across the globe. As we celebrate the Maldives Tourism Golden Jubilee, 
we are very optimistic and we are very optimistic of achieving our target for this year, 1.6 million tourists with 30 million bed nights. In 2023, we expect, we expect to have over 2 million tourists with 14.5 million bed nights. The global health and other crises has shown that tourism is very fragile industry. Taking on from the lessons and experience, it's time for the, country, for the countries to have a more <clears throat> resilient approach uh, in tourism development. We must address climate change and related environmental implications. We should think and be ready to act beyond sustainable development goals to give direct benefits of tourism to the communities. Destinations product base ought to be broadened to give room for creative products of the new world for the next generation tourist, tourists of the future, fast becoming the present, wish for yet smoother travel experiences, even in uncertain times, and to be able to utilize modern ICT improvements to allow themselves to seamlessly work even during their holidays, their travels. We must also consider the changes that are coming to the global financial market And, and currencies, including the opportunities and implications of cryptocurrencies. We must also capitalize on the increasing number of senior citizens that are traveling. On a similar note, tourism development and design and in management, we must take into consideration making tourism accessible to all. Differently abled people must be accommodated for, not only on principles of equality, but it is a very significant, large source market. Maldives is set to welcome 2023 with our fifth tourism master plan, with a vision of Maldives becoming the world's most sustainable tourism destination. This entails a special focus on tourism diversification, take tourism and all its benefits to the people and on empowering women and youth. Tourism is a people industry and it must be centered on people to people interaction and their well being. I thank ADB for organizing this important seminar and ADB's uh, continued support towards uh, inclusive development, particularly in tourism. I also convey heartfelt uh, appreciation to global destinations in private sector and other stakeholders who are committed and are tirelessly working towards sustainable tourism development. Let's all do our best to walk the talk of reimagining tourism. Let's all join hands in taking tourism, tourism's resource base and all its benefits to the future generations in better shape. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Masoom. This was really a fascinating <clears throat> story of bouncing back from a major calamity. I mean, how Maldives has been able to really uh, come back uh, and to levels pre-pandemic and probably even higher. And yesterday, when actually I met the finance minister, Minister Amir, he said that next week, with tourists likely to start coming from China, you may actually have more than what you might expect. But I think there are a few lessons that are coming out of the story that you have shared. One is it's a story of grit, determination, and working with the people, working with all to deliver results. And your president led it from the front. I also like when you say that tourism is global and making tourism accessible to all. I think that's a very clear message that tourism has a huge opportunity. Also to have that faith that Mal Maldives is one of the safest destination is that actually helped turn the corner. And to have your economic frontline team, including these tourism people, at the forefront of the vaccine queue is something that seems to have helped you. I also feel that when you are talking about addressing climate change and relate, related environmental implications that de needs to be addressed, I think sustainable tourism is really the way to go. And also two more points. I think your the way you ended your speech, tourism is a people's industry and it must be centered on people-to-people -people interaction and well-being. I think that's a great message that you're leaving us with. 
also the special focus that you have talked about on the tourism diversification and how it could really benefit the people, empower the people, and also it can create opportunities for women and youth. I think there are several messages that have come out of your uh, speech. So thank you very much. What I would like to do is really invite the other panelists, and we will probably ask one or two questions per panelist to see what are the views that are coming from different parts of Asia and the Pacific. So if I may have a one general question for all the panelists, is that if you look at uh, the Maldives story, generally the governments have played a limited role in the industry with partial oversight and light touch management. However, in the case of Maldives, we have seen the government played an important and a very deep role. So do you feel that the government should play a more proactive role in tourism development or in tourism promotion? So maybe that's the first question to start this discussion. So maybe I can invite uh, Ms. Susanna Hakoyan first to... I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, great. Warm greetings again from Armenia. And thank you, ADB, for organizing this seminar and providing us opportunity to participate. So yeah, coming back to your question, of course, government's role is very, very important. So the COVID-19 pandemic had a major, had a major impact negative impacts on the Armenian tourism industry and the Armenian economy overall. The restrictions imposed on travel internationally and also on national level significantly affected uh, visitations in terms of declined numbers of tourists and also visitors. And to this end, it is also important to mention that Armenia was hit twice. Um, on the one side, we had the pandemic, but on the other side, we have the 2020 nagorno karabakh war. So, uh, so the southern part of the country where we have a high concentration of uh, natural and cultural attractions was hit the hardest. So this part of the country was being associated with the feeling of insecurity, uh, for foreigners, and especially after the international media recommendations uh, not to travel to this part of the country. But coming back to the pandemic, of course, our government also, Armenian government also uh, developed support programs uh, to address the social and economic impacts of the pandemic. The government of Armenia allocated almost 300 million uh, to support the economy and limit dollars, US dollars, yeah, and limit the impact of the pandemic. In a global response, uh, the International Monetary Fund has also announced the availability of 50 billion for countries that are members of the fund, and this includes also Armenia. So in order to meet the challenges posed by the spread of the corona coronavirus, the government of the Republic of Armenia adopted a package of uh, measures dedicated for the neutralization of the coronavirus-driven economic impact, so which uh, envisaged the provision of, of assistance to Armenian businesses, and in particular to provide assistance to uh, Armenian uh, business entities operating in certain sectors directly related to tourism to alleviate the financial problems and ensure the continuity of the operations and maintain existing jobs. Uh, another support was uh, provided to transport companies servicing to tourism uh, sector by reimbursing 75% of the unpaid interest from 2020, which helped these companies repay their loan obligations to ensure the continuity of their businesses, as well as pro protected assets pledged as coll collateral for the development loan. So overall, the government uh, developed support programs for the private sector, uh, uh, for tour operators and travel agencies uh, responsible for the organized, uh, for, for organized package travel. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hiran, would you like to give also a perspective from the Sri Lanka side? Because I think tourism was quite severely affected. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Prakash, because uh, uh, yeah, Sri Lanka was 
badly affected for three reasons. Not only the COVID, before COVID, it was the, uh, unfortunately, the Easter Sunday bombings, and then, of course, the economic and political turmoil in the country, So, which was actually a, a triple whammy for us in Sri Lanka. Uh, in in, in your, your question of, yes, should the government play a role? Definitely, yes. There is no two uh, doubts about that. But, you know, how should the government play that role is a question mark. I mean, you know, I'm not saying this because... Uh, Dr. Mauzun uh, is listening to this, uh, but, you know, take the Maldives, for example, it's such a proactive uh, action that uh, they had taken as against the most negative action that the Sri Lankan government took when, when all this happened. So, so how, how does, if, if you ask the Sri Lankans, should the government play a role? 90% of this would say no. Their answer will be no, because, you know, <laughs> you know it, it, it was a bad, bad call. Right, and so much so that the Maldives had to even uh, welcome our president who had to get out of the country. Uh, so, so be that as it may, uh, I think I think there was a role that the government played in Sri Lanka too. They gave us some uh, some help with the loans, uh, moratorium, uh, and and so on. But but I think I have I I personally have proposed that in a country like Sri Lanka. Uh, or the region. I mean, Maldives is blessed because it has less people uh, than most of the other countries. Take Thailand, Malaysia, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sri Lanka, which is, uh, of course, India, uh, Nepal. Uh, all of these countries have millions and millions of people. So it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, and the contribution of tourism to the GDP is probably, I mean, in Sri Lanka's case, is 5%. Uh, Thailand is 20%, something like that, whereas Maldives is almost 50%. That's huge. So, but I think I think it, they need to give that confidence back to the people that they are committed to tourism. A lot of Sri Lankans are leaving the country because the government is not focused on tourism. You know, when that happens, uh, we lose people. Uh, you know, the youth that are likely to join tourism will go somewhere else. So we, you know, the island of hospitality loses the people who provide that hospitality. So that's a problem for us at the moment. Some of them are working in the Maldives. Some are working in the Middle East. We need to bring them back if we are to, you know, bring that warm Sri Lankan smile again and that great hospitality again. So these are some of the things that the government must be aware. And tourism is not only for the tourism ministry, by the way. My, my, my 20-something or actually 30 years with Pata tells me that there are other ministries that are involved in tourism, finance, uh, uh, defense, health, uh, you know, transportation, aviation, environment, all of these are interlinked. So this is something that we need to also co-opt in countries like Sri Lanka, more, you know, Thailand, Malaysia, and all these places that all other ministries also must play a role if the government is to play an active role and to make tourism a significant contributor uh, to the to the GDP. Thank you. Yeah, I th thank you. Yeah, I think you have raised a couple of very interesting points. One, of course, is as the Maldivian experience said, that together we deliver. I think the, all of the actors have to come together. And also it is important to see that what are the kind of opportunities that are available for the people there. Because otherwise people can move away. So I think that's that's a very valid point. So maybe, yeah. uh, you know, let me now invite Miss Lockington and, uh, you know, from her perspective, see. In Fiji, again, tourism has been one of the key part of the uh, local economic growth story. But what is it that actually Fiji is doing to really retain its intrinsic values such as cultural heritage and natural environment? And how is tourism getting promoted in the Fiji Islands? Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at the forum, uh, especially at such an important time uh, as today to celebrate World Tourism Day. Um, I wanted to um, also have a quick response to your earlier question, you know, uh, should governments be involved? Um, and I believe the government has had to play a very proactive role, certainly here in Fiji. And I believe they did this extremely well because they understood um, from the very beginning just how critical the tourism industry is to the country. Uh, so the understanding was the faster we created a, a safer travel framework, the faster we could come back from the brink. 
Fiji is a Pacific Island country with a population of around 900,000 and where tourism contributes around 42% to GDP. Um, it employed 130,000 employees and most of these employees are female. So it's an industry that has very deep roots in the communities it operates from. And while it might have started um, as an industry, as a, as a default industry due to the, its location, um, you know, 300 plus islands sit in paradise-like locations with very naturally friendly people, it has grown at a phenomenal rate to be the largest foreign exchange earner here in Fiji, 2.1 billion in 2019, with remittances at its second highest earner at 800 million and bottled water exports coming in at around 300 million. So it's recognized by the government, by the public sector, that tourism is an industry that is very, very important um, to the country. Um, many of the things that we did uh, during the shutdown also allowed us to open up as safely as we did. And 10 months on, um, to say that we are uh, you know, very successfully uh, reopened and, and looking forward to a, a bumper year. Uh, right now, we're on our way to recovery with about 72% of our 2022 visitor target reached already and around 50% of our 2019 tourism earnings already reached. So what we did during the shutdown, for instance, uh, again, working very closely with the government to make this happen, um, we, we still had a few travel frameworks that allowed visitors in via very specific pathways, uh, either directly uh, through to island-bound resorts through private planes or via blue lanes where private yachts could come in and use their journey here as part of their quarantine time. So 10 months onwards, um, you know, we're looking at uh, how sustainable uh, sustainability needs to be incorporated into all the things that we do and how we can make uh, tourism having come through two long years, be a little bit more different uh, for, uh, so that we meet the expectations uh, of, our, of our visitor markets. And I think a lot of that has to do with understanding what the, the new traveler is expecting. And a lot of that expectation has to do with making sure that they can either give back uh, to the communities or making sure that they don't or they do uh, leave a, a smaller carbon footprint wherever they go. So we recognize that we do that already. We just needed to ramp up that message uh, in terms of going forward and taking tourism into the, the, uh, the, the place that we feel that it, it will be safer. I think fascinating and similar to the Maldives, I must say the Fiji has done very well. And I think a couple of points that are coming out quite clearly is that really this whole after two years of lockdown, the revenge tourism or the desire of people to travel and really go and explore new places is there and we must make full use of it. So maybe before uh, you know, I go to the next question, Gia, would you like to come in and say something about the Carex countries, how are, how are they really looking at post-COVID tourism? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. Um, as you mentioned earlier, um, ADB works with uh, regional cooperation mechanisms such as CAREC, uh, Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation, SASEC, Greater Mekong Subregion, ABEC, and other subregional initiatives. Um, and also, um, ADB works with government through single country projects to support tourism. Uh, which would serve as building blocks under uh, broader regional frameworks. Uh, ADB has been actively uh, engaged in tourism in the Central and West Asia region and has taken an integrated and systematic approach for tourism development through the CAREC program, which is a partnership of 11 countries and development partners to create a regional cooperation platform that connects people, policies, and projects for shared and sustainable development under which the CADEC 2030 strategy was developed uh, back in 2017. This CADEC strategy provides long-term strategic framework for the program leading to 2030 with trade, tourism and economic corridors identified as one of the five operational priorities. 
Under this uh, CADEC 2030 strategic framework, in December 2020, um, the CADEC Tourism Strategy 2030 was published, which set out a vision and a roadmap uh, very much aligned with uh, CADEC countries' national tourism uh, priorities, providing a common strategic and holistic framework to guide uh, tourism operations in the region. Its objective is, um, as you mentioned earlier, to promote sustainable, safe, and inclusive tourism development and enhance the region's attraction as a competitive tourism destination globally. Um, this uh, CADEC strategy, um, uh, tourism strategy, builds on the findings and recommendations of a detailed uh, scoping study called uh, Promoting Regional Tourism Cooperation, published in 2019 to better understand the sector in the region and uh, conduct a needs assessment through in-depth and wide um, stakeholder consultations with the country's private sector tour operators, among others. Um, the CADEC tourism team is very active and um, continues to support the government through an ongoing regional technical assistance for sustainable tourism development in the CADEC region. This technical assistance uh, aims to facilitate um, increased cooperation among the CADEC countries through the government-nominated tourism focus in respective um, countries to position the region as an attractive tourism destination under which it helped to prepare the CADEC tourism sector strategy and the regional tourism investment frameworks. And um, it continues to support institutional capacity of tourism authorities and exchange information through workshops and training activities uh, for tourism planning and policy making, market research and others. Uh, we are also supporting the development of a CADEC tourism web portal called the Visit Silk Road. Uh, this is to build a common brand as the Silk Road is uh, being the most important tourism asset linking uh, countries in the region. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gia. I think that's a very good perspective on the Karak countries. Karak countries actually are quite unique in terms of culture and history. So I think that's, and tourism does have a huge uh, potential in there. So maybe I think before I go to the next question, I would, I would like to request the minister, Dr. Abdullah Masoom, to really share his view. You know, uh, Maldives has done very well in terms of really bouncing back, but how sustainable it is and how difficult it is to really manage it with, suppose, the influx that you might get, and where what are the climate change challenges that you see in terms of managing the Maldive, Maldivian tourism influx of the tourists? Um, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Manmohan Prakash. Yeah. First of all, I wish to thank uh, you, um, uh, you and also uh, Hiran and, and the rest of the panelists for your comments on the Maldives. I think uh, it is, we, we really was a, uh, that all of us doing it together. Um, you are absolutely right now, there is so much pent up demand there, especially about 25% of our previous markets are not here. When they start coming, but we are very much uh, geared to receive them. Uh, at uh, one of the uh, infrastructure aspects, we uh, have been running behind the capacities, our international gateway. But the new term, new runway is there, new sea, term, uh, sea uh, plane terminal is there, and the new terminal will come into one. But this year, we are not going to have any difficulty because during the COVID time, we have the capacity limitations, you know. So we were able to get X number of uh, about 6,000, 7,000 arrivals a day. So we will be able to cope with the coming two years um, until we open the new terminal. With uh, I think the biggest challenge for now is the development. The development has become more costly uh, in terms of uh, coastal management uh, aspects uh, we have to do. 
earlier, uh, the, the tourism investment don't have to consider so much on uh, coastal management. But I'm very happy that uh, tourism uh, sector itself are very responsible and uh, in, in terms of um, uh, uh, environmental management, we believe that they are really self-regulatory and uh, we are just facilitating the biggest um, challenge is the biggest opportunity because we have we are facilitating the new investors to come to the Maldives and develop their their, their, their uh, dream project. And our restrictions only on environmental restrictions plus safety and security restrictions. Other, other things, their imagination is the one that we want them to come and implement here because we wish to remain as the Maldives, um, we, we wish to remain as the world's leading destination and Maldives have to have the best of it. Yeah, in terms of, um, I think, uh, energy is another area that we really need. Uh, the new travelers, they are very uh, conscious of uh, various aspects of environment, but uh, we need to mold this, the resorts, we have to produce our own energy. So we are going for solar. And also in terms of uh, total environmental management, government is fully committed. Our president's uh, pledges, targets are more uh, stronger and more focused than the rest of the world. For example, uh, my president Brahm Soli has uh, set target to, for Maldives to have net zero by 2030 and on um, managing plastic, we are already have uh, started banning single-use plastic and by 2023 we'll fully have that one. The the capacity management, um, we, we, we are happy that uh, even though other destinations are now open and receive people, uh, the pent-up uh, demand is there. There are so many uh, my, my bo boyfriends and girlfriends, they have promised Maldives, but uh, were not able to come in the last two, three years. So they are, they are willing to come. And we are hoping for very good October, November, December. And as uh, Dr. Prakash, you mentioned, um, I talked with our uh, my, uh, finance minister, we are hoping that we will start getting the our our earlier number one market, China, soon, and getting them would be good. But Maldives is ready to receive 2.5 million tourists now, so we we can do that. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I think that's a very positive note. But I think I also note two small little points. One is I think green tourism, which is now the in thing, is important and it helps to reduce the use of fossil fuel and increase things like solar, geothermal, and others. So I think it's important for us to promote sustainable tourism together with the green tourism and also look at opportunities for the uh, livelihoods and local uh, local produce. The second thing that is also important, which is coming out from several uh, speakers, is that post-COVID-19, the recovery needs to be just and sustainable. And there is a huge potential of the long stay travelers, senior citizens, and digital nomads. So maybe if I move to some of the questions that are coming from the pigeonhole from the audience, I think the first question that has really attracted a lot of uh, 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 lot of attention is what are the benefits of attracting longer staying tourists, such as digital nomads? And I think uh, Dr. Masum, you had talked about it, or even from Fiji side, I think it's not looking to mention that how should we design tourism campaigns and development plans to cater to these long term travelers? So maybe anyone, anyone can take the floor. It's a question from the audience. Yes, please, Dr. Masu. Yeah, yeah, I think that is the one we are targeting because our tourism, uh, our, the, the biggest market now is India. They, they, they can come for weekend. But uh, I think with uh, border crossings, it's uh, the travel is a hassle, so when they come, they are going to stay longer. So we have got real estate tourism as a major component, and we are geared up for uh, longer stay tourism uh, uh, just in the visa regime. And uh, there is a huge market of senior citizens who would love to come to a destination stay longer. And I think coastal destination has a big advantage. People, people believe, and I think it's very true that uh, the sea, sea breeze and uh, seeing the water, it, it soothes you, it's good for life. So um, I think it's a very important market, especially for the digital nomads, it's, it's very important because if you can work from anywhere, 
why don't you work from a place where you get the best relaxation and uh, um, every, everything in terms of uh, you enjoy and we work and uh, for uh, because uh, the the duration of stay with uh, bed nights uh, it, with increased bed nights it's good for the revenue and uh, in island communities what we say uh, is a very important thing because especially in the small islands when people come and stay for longer they become part of the community and they don't believe themselves as a tourist anymore they start on social projects uh, where they, they they would donate this and that and that and a lot of benefits to the community so that's an area that i think um, all the destinations should focus on we are definitely going very strong towards the longer stay guests thank you excellent excellent yes maybe anybody else miss lockington mr hiran yes luck mr hiran thank Hiran's. you I, i'll yeah so um fiji is thinking about it uh, but we have a few uh, challenges in front of us before we will probably get down that path um one is you know to uh, reconsider where our tax and immigration policies stand uh, in terms of uh, longer term tourism stays like that or um, tourism nomads uh, the other one is uh, accessing um, uh, better me medical services this would be a key consideration especially for the um, for the older older generations uh, and it but it is definitely on the horizon and, and something that uh, we are working through uh, as well as with uh, working with government to see how we can address these but it certainly is an opportunity that is being considered oh excellent yes yes mr hira yeah. Oh, yeah thank you i think sri lanka is uh, sri lanka was a beneficiary of digital nomads in the past and we are trying to attract more and more in, in the future as well our medical facilities are good and all the other services are uh, working quite well uh, one advantage with the digital nomads that we've noticed is that they promote the destination as well while they work uh, in the country so that's that's something that's useful uh, one or two of them got involved in our policy but but most of them uh, uh, they, they they were very proactively promoting the destination uh, we are also looking at the you know the retired market because that's that's something that's uh, that's going to i mean you know not not necessarily digital nomads but uh, who will spend a longer time in sri lanka especially uh, when you consider the european winter if they are short of uh, gas and all the heating facilities uh, sri lanka maldives thailand uh, malaysia will be great places uh, for them to spend uh, at least 2 3 months of the really cold winter as uh, dr mausun said you know by the beach in any of these countries is a great place to spend uh, the winter for those who are retired uh, and for a reasonable amount of money as well so that's something and our government sri lanka has uh, extended the six month visa facility uh, you know this uh, can get only up to one month and now they are giving uh, up months visa so uh, benefit as well because otherwise every month they have to keep renewing the visa so once that comes into place it will be very easy for them so yes most countries are focused on uh, the state plan there now oh, yeah no i think the visa issue that you mentioned is certainly important and also the senior citizens i think that is also yeah. yes miss hakobayan i can see you also coming in yes please thank you So I would say our case differs a lot from those of small island destinations because Armenia is not an island destination but it is a landlocked country. So and we have close borders but we have open borders only with two of our neighbors yeah with Iran and Georgia. But what we saw in terms of domestic nomads so uh in the face of this uh, Russia Ukraine war so we saw a lot of uh, tourists coming to Armenia and uh, uh well uh working from Armenia yeah so uh we seen increase a huge increase in the arrival numbers and what we want to do regarding the digital nomads is to tourism in Armenia is mainly concentrated in the capital city so we want to direct the tourism to the regions in Armenia so the local community can benefit more from this so the tourists will stay in the regions they will spend in the regions and they will benefit the local community 
So this is a very important point for us, for the government. So to, and also we work closely with uh, international partner organizations as well to develop the project or to direct this flow of tourists to the regions of Armenia. And uh, yeah, again, to note that we saw a huge increase in the no number of uh, tourists and nomads yeah, coming from uh, both Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think this is fantastic and fascinating. It's not only about really the people who want to come to stay, like digital nomads or senior citizens, but also an opportunity when there is a certain, uh, you know, certain crisis or something. So I think in case of Armenia, that's quite clear. So maybe let's move to a second question that's also coming from the pigeonhole. And this is more to do, let's say, I mean, in fact, I might say that, you know, Armenia uh, case or Sri Lanka's case or Fiji's case, and uh, Maldives case, it is quite relevant, is that how a country with the intrinsic values such as cultural heritage and natural environment, et cetera, and uh, promote tourism, which is based on a policy of high value, low volume, or sustainable in the future. I guess there are two elements of this, that you know most countries will have either unique natural or cultural assets, or they may have some other uh, you know, special endowments. What is it that could be done really to use these endowments and these uh, values to attract tourists and to attract more tourism. So maybe, uh, uh, you know, maybe Susanna, you can start because Armenia, I think, is landlocked, as you said, but it's at the, it's really the link between Asia and Europe. So it's quite an interesting uh, country. So maybe you can take this question first. Yes, sure. Yeah, of course, Armenia is well known as a cultural uh, tourism destination because we have a lot of culture heritage sites. But the thing is that uh, as a, well, Armenia is also recognized tourism as a priority sector on the state level. So this is one of the principles of the state policy. And uh, the overall goal of these policies to ensure our cu cultural sustainability and also natural sustainability, to increase the contribution to the sustainable development of the national economy and also to the equal territorial economic growth, yeah? While at the same time alleviating poverty through sustaining high levels of the growth, increasing tourism uh, generated income through offering high value products and services, and also creating new job opportunities. But uh, we also, as a, we take it as a challenge uh, from the government side to uh, try to position Armenia not only as a culture and, uh, and natural heritage destination, but also uh, trying to diversify the touristic offer. Because uh, as I mentioned already, yes, Armenia has a huge potential also in terms of uh, offering different types of experiences such as agriculture, such as wine, such as gastro, recreational, yeah. But yes, uh, uh, we are mainly positioned uh, as a cultural heritage destination. Excellent. I think that's a very good perspective. So maybe... Can I so also can respond, have... uh, Dr. Please. Yeah. Yes, yeah. please. Uh, I, think, I, 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 I think this is linked high value uh, tourism as well as, uh, you know, managing the cultural, natural assets of a country. If you look at Sri Lanka in particular, uh, you know, in the 1970s, most of these places were pretty much abandoned or uh, just about sort of, uh, I mean, it, then it's tourism that contributed the money for the restoration and protection of these assets. Uh, so that is something that's, you know, we have a central cultural fund that the money that is going in when you visit the cultural triangle of Sri Lanka goes into that. And that money is uh, utilized for research and restoration of those cultural assets. Similarly, if you take the national parks where the animals live, you know, if there wasn't tourism, most of those people living around those areas would naturally kill the animals and eat them because there is no other livelihood for them. Now they become trackers, they become jeep drivers, they become beneficiaries of the national park. So by protecting the national park, they make a living. So therefore, I think I think tourism has contributed, you know, heavily to the protection of a country's culture, country's natural assets. Uh, that's something that we shouldn't forget. And that is, uh, you know, experiential travel as well. Today we talk of experiential travel. 
how can the locals give an experience-based tour? You know, how can a, you know a local give an experience-based meal in these natural environments? And these are things that can must be uh, you know promoted and protected. And I I think the more we promote uh, and encourage local communities to get involved in, you know. I mean, look, now there are so many words, sustainable tourism, geotourism, green tourism, ecotourism, all these things. But what are we talking of? We are talking of good tourism. Good tourism means benefit to the local communities, benefit to the tourist who comes because you give them a very nice interpretation, you teach, you share your values, your, your wealth of experience in something. Once you do that, that becomes good tourism, you know, so the, the, the people who come protect and help protect, uh, you know, the locals as well. So that's, that's to me, is integral. It's, it's a, it's a win-win solution. Thank you. No, I think very good point. Yes, Miss Luckington. Yes, um, my, my, I, I totally agree. Um, I was about to say a, a similar thing. Um, Fiji, for instance, we could become a world brand uh, rather than just catering to our traditional markets. Uh, and, and we have a lot more to offer than we already do. But it's not a simple thing to maintain the required balance between sustainable tourism uh, without giving in to over-tourism. And um, as, as the speaker just said before me, tourism does help to protect the environment. Um, it recognizes cultures and traditions because it probably understands uh, the importance of diversity and the interaction with the local communities having um, a lot more popularity and a lot more visibility uh, with the visitors than any other thing is simply, you know, like sightseeing, for instance. So uh, uh, exploring underwater, exploring um, uh, into the rural areas and interacting with local communities those things can come naturally, but you must make sure that uh, there, is a, um, there is a keen understanding of making sure that you don't cross over the boundaries that protect these communities. So I do agree, it, it, it can be done, uh, but it needs to be managed um, very carefully. Yeah, no, I think absolutely excellent point. Dr. Masum, anything on your side on this part? Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, absolutely the new, as Hiran mentioned, that experiential tourism is giving a good chance for us to uh, revive a lot of things, culture, heritage, things that have be, may not be there. Uh, like uh, in Maldives, we have 185 inhabited islands at the moment also, but earlier we had 200. These have got a lot of cultures that, uh, given the accessibility and also given a uh, things like, uh, as uh, Fantasia mentioned, uh, the hospital and these type of things, with the expertise, people now would like to go somewhere and experience them. And we have to make a product out of it, and that benefits the whole community. I remember here, and I, I, was, I can recall that place I went to, Siguria and on way back, there was this uh, uh, small uh, tribal cemetery uh, uh, like place where old and maybe one particular tribe of Sri Lankan were there and that has become a major tourist attraction now. So once so we the community? Yeah, 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 yeah that's the, the one. the community? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, 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 that's yes, a yes. Yeah. 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 So so these type of things is very it, it makes the product very strong and uh, um, it, it's a, a good way. I'm, there are many more events, uh, mm -hmm. Susanna, who would wish to go to Armenia and also to Fiji uh, for, for retirement and everything else, because <laughs> I think I'd like to you know, have a different experience. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, if I really look at the, the messages that are coming out, I think one message is very clear, that we really need to rebrand tourism to see it either as a mass market destination or move towards a more niche experience that can capitalize on the unique culture, but at the same time also create greater economic participation for those who are really dependent on tourism for their livelihoods. I think that's the kind of message that I am getting. Yeah. But there was also an interesting point that you made, Dr. Masum, and I think earlier Hiran had also made, 
And we are also getting a question, which is really, how do you encourage the dispersion of tourisms, to, tourists within a sub-region? You know, for example, you said that many people may like to go to Armenia, some people may like to go to Fiji, some people may like to go to Sri Lanka, some people may go to like to Nepal, Bhutan, or different, uh, Laos and others. So do you feel that, uh, you know, creating tourism circuits or regional itineraries or regional tourism development plans, would that be useful? Like in the case of Carrick, Gia had said, you know, the Carrick tourism uh, plan is really looking more at creating opportunities for tourism within the region or sub-region. So any one of you can start on that part. It's a question that you know, I just come from the pigeonhole. I, I have a different view to that, uh, Dr. Prakash, because uh, I think now there is, there is uh, you know, especially there's a lot of air travel available. There is, uh, there is uh, you know, low-cost carriers to you know, ways to get get from A to B. You look at the Maldives, so many flights coming in to every country. I think when people travel, they must stay longer in one place rather than just go, uh, you know, from like now sometimes we do tours like one night in uh, uh, Frankfurt, one night in Paris, one night in London, one night somewhere else. You just take pictures and you come back. You don't really experience uh, a city, a place, whatever. So when you travel, I think you, let's say someone goes to Armenia, you know, you spend two, three weeks in Armenia, you really learn about the culture, you learn about the people, their food and everything, and then you absorb in that, uh, you know, environment and come. If you go to Fiji, the same thing, you know, uh, what does the Fijians do, you know, what is their livelihood, what do they, I mean, you know, you learn that when you come back, rather than just to, I mean, you know, earlier we used to do Sri Lanka, Maldives, Nepal, whatever, but I think now the, the travels, travel has advanced, airlines have so much of connectivity, unless for those who are really retired and who can spend three months one month in Sri Lanka, one month in Maldives, one month in Nepal. Otherwise, you just go to Maldives, spend a month, really enjoy Maldives and come back. And then come to Sri Lanka, spend a month, enjoy. That's that's the way I would like travel to be. I'm, I'm not sure whether the others will agree with that. Thanks. No, I, I think that's an interesting view. Maybe let's hear the others as well. Yes. Yeah, just, I, I think I want to add on that. The the I think the new tourists uh, they really like to stay. Um, uh, sometimes like I, I am a, I am rather a hopper. Uh, I, I would <laughs> love, to, but but uh, while doing that, I like to get uh, experiences. But uh, Iron is absolutely right. Many people like to come and really get it. It's just like me. You just simple example. If you I, when I visit a museum. Half an hour is enough for me to see the museum. For others, it's they need the whole day. Slowly, very slowly, they would experience that. Uh, I, I think, Jia, uh, you are really uh, in a very uh, responsible, I think, rich uh, area you are looking after. Asia Pacific has got a lot of uh, rich culture and heritage, and uh, I, I would love, I'd love to travel in this part of the world rather than going to. Uh, other other parts, mainly because of the culture, heritage, and the, you know the people. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Gia, please come. Yeah. Yes, Gia. Um, the you know one of the emerging trends that we are seeing right now is uh, that tourists are increasingly focus on sustainability and responsible travel. Um, and also uh, looking for authentic experiences. And um, we expect uh, going forward a greater focus on low density and eco-sustainable tourism. And, um, you know, I, I work in Central and West Asia, so I can only speak for the region. Um, you know, the, the foreign tourists from distant countries, when they land in Karek, they just don't want to come for a single country, but they would rather go for multiple countries because they're drawn to this, uh, you know, colorful um, culture and heritage, uh, nature and adventure. And uh, the region actually offers all those things. Um, to uh, help capitalize on the region's uh, unique tourism assets um, and cater to the various segments, uh, you know, of tourism, such as uh, business, uh, culture, nature, adventure, 
sun and beach and health wellness and all that. I mean, the, the region, the correct region has that. And, um, and uh, we have actually introduced uh, five guiding principles to promote um, the effective uh, regional tourism programs as well as uh, sustainable tourism development. That is um, actually um, to provide quality over quantity to ensure um, environmental, social, and cultural sustainability, and also adapting to global trends and building resilience, uh, reducing regional imbalances, and empowering local communities. And also, there's a lot of seasonality uh, when it comes to tourism industry. So we wanted to promote uh, multi-seasonal tourism. And um, we would also um, like to, I mean, we, we would like to adopt a holistic and based approach um, for developing uh, the tourism network along the Silk Road. Uh, while um, ensuring sustainable development of the regional clusters. And um, under the Karek uh, Tourism Strategy 2030, we've also identified uh, seven priority regional tourism clusters that, con that is connected to main tourist routes, um, which are Caspian, Heart of Central Asia, Almaty Bishkek, Golden Coast located in Pakistan uh, and, and uh, Altai, Gobi, grasslands, etc. Um, and in order to also um, accelerate uh, the, the priority projects, uh, uh, tourism projects in the region, uh, we have uh, also um, included a regional tourism investment framework for 2021 and 2025. Over. Yeah, no. Thank you, Gia. Very interesting. Yes, yes, Miss Luckington. Yeah, please. Uh, you have to unmute. Susanna, would you like to uh, come yeah. in? Just to add that the, regarding the Silk Road, so we included it in our national strategy because Armenia, uh, from, from north to south, we have an uh, amazing Silk Road heritage. Uh, it's still kind of, can be said, it's still untouched, but uh, this year we will have our strategy finalized by the end of the year. And a Silk Road is one of the, in, in line with culture, nature, adventure, and gastro, Silk Road will be another direction that we uh, will put on the national level. And we will appear and we hope to, uh, by the help of ADB and other donor organizations, we will appear on the map of Silk Road. So that's that's a great initiative. And uh, hopefully Armenia will also for part of that. Excellent, very good. Yes, yes, Fantasha. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, loud and clear. Oh, okay. I was going to say, um, I believe it has a lot to do with how you promote your destination. Um, for Fiji, we're, we're based, you know, right in the, the southern hemisphere in the in the South Pacific Ocean. So if people are coming long distance, um, they try and get a few countries on the way. So they may want to stop in Australia and New Zealand as well as come to Fiji. Having said that, even if they came just directly to Fiji, amongst the 300 islands, there's so many different things to do. You could opt to stay a longer time if you were, for instance, diving somewhere. And so spend a longer time in one place or you could travel around and see very many different types of uh, tourism offerings uh, by moving around, you know, within your nine to 10 days that you stay. Um, it also depends on the season, as uh, Gia mentioned. Uh, Fiji is also very seasonal in terms of its uh, tourism uh, draw. It also um, looks out for different segments. So you may have families coming uh, once or twice a year uh, usually uh, coming to the same place, 
or you may have younger people who are now looking to more sustainable tourism options, they will be the ones that will be looking out for uh, the places that they can give back to a community um, to, uh, to be, uh, take part, for instance, in uh, rebuilding a, a, a reef, uh, to do some ocean protection type program. So it depends on what the people are looking for. So if you want to make sure that you get a little bit of everything, your promotion of your destination is going to be key to your making sure that your markets come and get what they're looking for. So key is in communication, I believe. No, excellent. I think this has been really fantastic, uh, you know, listening to uh, different viewpoints. And I think that the main thing that I am getting out of this is that the relevance of tourism it has never been more clear. You know, it is really, really there. And the time is really to seize this opportunity and reimagine tourism to see, you know, how we can benefit the visitors, the hosts, the natural world or the local heritage. I mean, the Silk Road heritage, which has been talked about, I mean, it is an amazing historical experience and which is being developed and similarly developing these natural habitats, ecotourism and others. I think so huge opportunity. So I think we have now come to an end of this fascinating seminar. So probably I'd like to thank all the panelists before I just give the wrap up and the closing remarks. So we exchanged so many views, so many new ideas and, and you know they came up as part of our discussion. So let me now try to summarize some of the key takeaways from today's seminar. First is I think this COVID-19 pandemic has led to the rethinking of how we should be promoting tourism and tourism's role in promoting development. And countries like Maldives, Fiji, uh, Armenia, which we have shared today, actually have shown how they have managed to turn the COVID-19 crisis into an opportunity to embrace innovation in the tourism sector. The second thing is there there are some missed opportunities, as one could see, like Sri Lanka's case, we says. So in the case of COVID-19, countries could have been better off by probably having a more coordinated response at a regional or global level and turning insular and prioritizing national level policy responses did not really help. I think that's also coming out quite clearly. Having said that, there is also a realization that a return to business as usual is no longer tenable or a desirable option for tourism. So while tourism has been a key driver of growth in the past, it has also contributed to certain challenges of environment, pollution and congestion. So I think it is important for us to really look at tourism and developing tourism more responsibly, sustainably, and also in a very close collaboration with the local livelihood opportunities. So as we are trying to help the recovery process, I think there are several uh, opportunities, once in a lifetime opportunities that have come up uh, out of the discussion today. One I think is promoting niche tourism that is more focused on more authentic and sustainable experiences. The second is to encourage the dispersion of tourists within the sub-region or within a, a group of countries through the creation of regional itineraries or tourism circuits. We also heard many of the speakers talk about promoting off-season tourism or opening new destinations for new experience. And of course, in that, attracting longer staying tourists or longer staying guests like these nomad travelers or senior citizens could really give some exciting opportunities. So the, moving forward, I think it's also important that the government, the private sector, the international organizations and other agencies need to work together at the national and the regional level. and the private sector support will be quite critical in making sure that tourism is able to get its right place in the economy. So, so thank you, friends. It's been quite useful. I hope these ideas can be applied in the areas where you work. And from ADB's side, we are here to support you. We will also benefit from the various insights that we have got through today's seminar. So let me end the seminar by encouraging everyone to keep this conversation going. There's still so much that we can learn from each other. You know, this was just about a one and a half hour session, but so much of rich knowledge came by. So please also, I request you to visit the beautiful destinations that this region offers. This is for the audience, because that will be the best tribute to the local people, their cultures, and their values. Enjoying local cuisine, local products, and local culture will help us also to preserve communities 
that are so essential for our diversity. So friends, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all the panelists for contributing to today's webinar, as well as those who tuned in to ask these interesting questions and to the organizers for hosting this event so efficiently. Thank you all and have a nice pleasant evening. Thank you everybody.